And he, he didn't think I should go to law school because I had a funny name, quote, funny name. Because it was the first time I had ever thought that somebody's last name could be a burden or a, an obstacle. But I have to tell you, I was a bit naive in this respect. I thought, you know, you were just a Canadian was a Canadian was a Canadian. They left their homes and families in search of a better life. These are the lives of Canadians, the stories of Italian immigrants and their descendants. Welcome to Persona. Born in Vancouver in 1937, Frank Iacobucci is a second-generation Italian-Canadian whose career coincides with Canada's transformation into a multicultural society. Well-respected as an academic, teacher, and jurist, he has served Canadians with integrity and honesty his entire career. In 1991, he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. This is Frank Iacobucci. My father was from central Italy, Abruzzo, and he went to Canada uh, in 1921 to 22, the year of Mussolini uh, assuming power in Italy. He went, he came as, to Canada as a 19 year old. He left his home because he had, I think, had a falling out with his parents, particularly his father, um, because he was one of six or seven children, six sisters, I think, uh, and uh, one, he was the only son, and his father had adopted someone older than my dad and had left the interest in the tenant, they were tenant farmers, uh, to the older adopted son, and my father felt quite insulted by this and really quite hurt by it and decided to make his way to Canada. He chose Vancouver because he had a, an older sister and brother-in-law who were there who had, I think, gone to Vancouver in 1909. And then my mother, that was uh, even, I think, quite a remarkable story because she left southern Italy. She was from Calabria. And she left southern Italy to, with two uncles who were in Vancouver and doing quite well. Had a little cigarette cigar store business just off of Victory Square, I think it was, in Vancouver. And she again came, was one of seven children, six sisters and one son, and life was very tough for both my mother and father in Italy. Life was very tough. And so they, it was decided that she would go to Canada and make her way there because it would, it would be a better life and it would be uh, not as onerous for her parents. So she left when she was only about 16 years old and never to see her parents again, um, which was a big sadness in her life because she was very close to her parents. She wrote to them a lot. She sent them things and helped, even though they were, she was not wealthy. I was born in Vancouver and uh, before the Second War, and it was in a a part of Vancouver, the east end of Vancouver, which in those days were relived, was a mixed multicultural uh, neighborhood. It was uh, not, uh, you know, uh, dominated by one particular ethnic group. There were Anglo phones and sort of uh, Oriental people and uh, continental European, uh, just a wonderful mix. My father, when he arrived, worked in lumber camps, mining uh, operations in the interior of British Columbia. Um, he did labor jobs in Vancouver, road construction. He had um, you know, no formal skills, uh, but was a tr tremendously hard worker. You know, times were tough. Uh, during the Depression, it was unbelievably difficult for the family. Um, so that was, uh, then the war came, and of course, it, and, and indeed, uh, several aspects to that uh, 
period were one, my father lost a very good job at the airport in Vancouver because of his, his, his uh, alien status. And although he never was bitter about, about that. Um, but, and then there was examples of some Italian Canadians who were interned during the war. My older brother's father-in-law was one of those, two, re two years rather in Petawawa, uh, shipped from Vancouver, and lost his business and so on. Uh, so those were reminders that, you know, that life in the new country wasn't all, you know, sort of peaches and cream. You're watching Persona. You're watching Persona. I loved school. I just really had a great uh, thirst for education. And, and there are some explanations for that. One was my older brother nurtured in me a curiosity, an interest that I had. And he would sp spend hours t telling me things, teaching me things that, that I would made me quite a, well advanced of my age group and that so that was and then uh, he played a central role and then secondly my teachers throughout um, at elementary junior high high school um, a number of them were, were just great mentors to me in in, um, in, in encouraging me to, to do well in school and to move on and then when I brought home my report cards I can remember being just thrilled if I did when I did well, and particularly well, I, I, my parents beamed with pride. The schools, for the most part, that I attended, were, I, I just found them very, very uh, influential in my life. And uh, there was lots of sports to play and lots of activities. But there was also temptations on the other side of, if you like, those kinds of act activities. In other words, you. If you didn't, you know, you had to pay attention and, and make sure that you were not tempted by either uh, not continuing with school or, or getting into mischief, put it that way. I was also very fortunate to be reasonably good in sports. So I played an awful lot of sports uh, in Vancouver. And Vancouver was just beautifully situated for sports throughout the year. So I played team sports, soccer, basketball, baseball um, in particular. And 
you know, played on provincial championship teams, and, and that was another world of uh, teaching me a lot about life, lessons that I think I, uh, I could apply throughout my professional uh, involvement. For example, resilience. I mean, there was always someone better than I was. There was always someone, a team stronger. You always go, you couldn't win every game. You had to lose. The question is, how were you going to treat defeat? How were you going to treat a setback? There was, on their part, they, they thought going on to study was very, very special. Um, and they just were delighted with my plans to go to university. Uh, there's just no doubt about it. I, I've always believed that they had the opportunity. They would have been very good students. They both had high, high intelligence. His parents always said, get an education, because that can never be taken away from you. And Frank is the one, fam one in the family of the, of the four children who did go on to university. And I think that was a source of great pride to his parents. Um, his father retired at, at the age, at quite a young age, the age of 59, when Frank graduated from law school. And I think he probably felt that this, you know, this was sort of a, the epitome of what was going to happen in terms of his children becoming professionals. You know, the first year I went, I used to eat lunch in the car because we were from the I like to say the poor side of the tracks, not the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, we didn't have a network uh, of contacts and friends that, as kids from the other side of Vancouver did because they would, more of those went to university. That. But I, I, because I was an athlete, I got involved with other people and I had a good friend who went to university ahead of me and he joined a fraternity and he encouraged me to join a fraternity and to some extent uh, I became a little bit of a of, 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 a, of a, an eccentric or a, a, an attraction in the sense that I was of Italian background from the east end of Vancouver and here I was in a fraternity and meeting with the athletes on the campus and the sort of you know the people who were the movers and shakers I suppose and, and that had a tremendous effect. I met some wonderful people through that and, and indeed friends for life uh, that I keep, still keep very close contact with. So it was a sort of opening up and I think the country was changing. I wasn't aware of this, but I think Canada was changing at the time. It was going from a, a more, if you like, uh, sort of uh, co community of English speaking to a more multicultural society. And I was a part of that, and it, it, was, it was just an absolutely wonderful experience. You're watching Persona.
you're watching Persona. I sort of thought about being a doctor when I was a kid, you know, that uh, this was a position of respect and uh, learning and uh, importance in the sense of serving people. So I thought about a doctor being the sort of somewhat distant goal. However, when I was in grade six, we, we, this, I can remember it as though it happened yesterday. The school principal, we had a little ceremony, graduating from grade six to go to junior high school, which was seven, eight, and nine, grade seven, eight, and nine. And he said a couple of words about each of us as we came up to get our little diploma. And about me, he said, well, here's Frank. He's a talker, a, a real talker. He's, go he's probably going to be another Angelo Branca. Now, Angelo Branca was a very distinguished criminal lawyer in Vancouver, obviously of Italian heritage. And I didn't really know who, who he was because, you know, I wouldn't have been aware of who. So, but I went home and asked my dad about him. My father knew him. And uh, so that somehow planted the seed of my being a lawyer. And later on, when I discovered that I wasn't particularly good at dealing with blood and seeing blood, so I thought, well, I'm not so sure about this medical profession. And then that, the seed of, 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 of lawyering and studying the law, uh, you know, took, took effect and, and uh, started to... I started to think about more and more, and so I, when I went to university, I was set on, on the law as a result of that little talk by the principal back in grade six. One of, on the way to law school, I had a course in economic statistics by, given by a Polish man by the name of Maniszewski. He took a great interest in me, and I've never forgotten. He's now since died. And, and he, he didn't think I should go to law school because I had a funny name, quote, funny name. And, and I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, it's not a name that the law profession would accept as much. So we went to see a great man, named John Deutsch, who became president of Queen's University of Princeton. The Queen's, and he said, no, if I wanted to be a lawyer, Canada was changing. I mentioned that because it was the first time I had ever thought that somebody's last name could be a burden or a, an obstacle in doing whatever he or she wanted. It sort of was a, wake, a little bit of a wake-up call to say, well, what, what do you mean? Is there something that, uh, that's wrong with my wanting to be a lawyer? I'm not, I'm not suited. Because there weren't that many uh, of Italian background. Angela Branca uh, being one, a very prominent, went on to be a judge court on the BC Court of Appeal. So I had but, well, I really, I really like the law, but is this really something that, that is for me? And, and Deutsch was right. Canada was changing. Uh, minorities were being welcomed into the profession. But he was right also to point out that Canada was changing because before the profession was very, very close to women, very, very close to uh, visible minorities, uh, very, very close to those of the Jewish faith. Because I had done reasonably well, I was able to get a fellowship to go to England and study, do postgraduate work in Cambridge. And that's where I met Nancy and uh, their, you know, first part of my life, my parents and family, second part of my life, <laughs> my, my wife. She is, without a doubt, the number one reason why I had such a wonderfully you know diverse career and been able to do many things uh, we both went to Cambridge University to do international law after our first law degrees and we met in the first seminar for the international law graduate students which was kind of a, a neat thing a neat way to meet a neat place to meet in when you did graduate work in law in those days particularly in those days it was expected of you that you would think about teaching law as an academic, in an academic setting, obviously, and, and not practicing law. So I had thought then that possibly one day I'd like to teach law. Because if you've, if you've done well and you've gone on to graduate school, that's an option that's, that's open. But when we 
we were married, we needed to get to a place that where we could both work, and so that we chose New York as that place. And I went into practice for a while, and then when Nancy was pregnant, I thought, well, I don't, we don't want to, neither of us wanted to live in New York to raise a family, but we found it professionally very rewarding. So I had always had to be, uh, to be candid, we, I'd always had at the back of my mind the possibility of teaching, because the way things were in those days, if you did well, you went to graduate school, you could think about it. So then I applied for some teaching jobs and was successful in getting one at the University of Toronto. So we moved back to, it was in the east, Nancy was happy and her family was happy and I was back in Canada, my parents were happy and we were happy to start our young family in Toronto. And I was at the University of Toronto for nearly 18 years and I loved it. But when I went to Toronto, the firm that I was with in New York called me and said, we'd like you to become general counsel of a client that I had worked for. And it was, the salary line was blank. I could fill it in. There were stock options and so on. And everybody who became associated with the company became multi, multi-millionaires. So I went home to Nancy and I said, well, what about this? And knowing that I knew what an answer was because it was having to move to Texas and she didn't want that. She wanted to raise a family and, and we said no. I mean, I said no the next day. Uh, even though it had been, as I said, a lot, a lot of money uh, in those days. And, and it was based on a family life decision. You're watching Persona. You're watching Persona. When I went to New York, I practiced law, and then I went to the University of Toronto, and I was in teaching law, and then I got administrative positions at the University of Toronto, and dealing with a large, if you like, uh, bureaucracy at the University of Toronto was important, because when I came to Ottawa in 85, as they say, this is the mother of all bureaucracies in this in our, in our country. And that was a real challenge to me. It was a challenge to come into this setting. It was a, I had no previous experience dealing with the political process, as I was as a deputy minister. You're dealing with ministers and the cabinet. And, 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 and uh, I hadn't been a product of the civil service. Most deputy ministers were products of the civil service. I wasn't. I came in from the outside. So I had a steep learning curve, very steep learning curve. Going from the academy to the civil service, there were some common features. There was an independence, 
in the university you're an academic no one tells you what to write or what to teach you are tremendous freedom in the civil service you're you're there to, because people want your judgment and your advice and if you start you know molding your judgment or your advice to tell them what they th you think they want to hear, then I think you're corrupting uh, the role of uh, deputy minister, no matter, but particularly in the Justice Department, which is so important to make sure that your the government is well advised on the law and what the, what the law says about a certain problem or issue. So, yeah, those were challenges coming here in Ottawa that I, uh, to say that it was easy is is not, uh, not accurate at all. For the most part, the cases that come to this court are pretty challenging and difficult and, and, uh, and, and fascinating. Um, some would say that they wouldn't be here unless they did have those attributes. But um, there have been, I can give you several answers or little different approaches to that. First, as, as a case that stands out in my mind, I, and I've mentioned this on other occasions, involves uh, Susan Rodriguez. This was the woman who was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease and wanted to have her last moments in life with her son. And then she felt that she wanted to have assistance in her bringing about her own death. And uh, she challenged the criminal code provision which says you cannot get assistance in assisted suicide is prohibited and that was a decision that caused me great personal anguish because she was so noble in her efforts her she wanted to die with dignity uh, and uh, she was so impressive in the way she conducted herself well I can criticize him but nobody else can and I guess that's uh... That sort of sums up my <laughs> my approach to his any problems he might have, um, either in the career or any other way. Um, I've just tried to be as supportive as possible whenever there have been glitches, and everybody's life has a glitch somewhere along the line. Throughout his career, Frank Iacobucci has carefully balanced the rule of law with the need for compassion in society. Drawing on his own experience, he has worked in both his professional and personal life to ensure that Canada remains a country in which differences are respected and diversity is nurtured. If I go back to where it all starts, maybe in, in the home, um, it, 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 being a Italo Canadian means to me a tremendous respect for family, a tremendous love of family. And in the total scheme of things, family is what is so vitally important.